Hello everybody and uh, welcome. This <laughs> I guarantee you this is going to get better. So I'm just trying a bunch of different things. We may, we may be doing this in different formats uh, as the semester as such as it is progresses. Um, so welcome back to Psych and Law, uh, at least virtual Psych and Law, and we're going to talk about forensic assessment in criminal cases, competence and sanity. This is lecture 10. Uh, this is a long one, so I'm going I'm to do it in chunks. And uh, if y'all are thinking about maybe what you expected to find in this class in Psych and Law, this is probably the lecture that most of you kind of expected to hear. So we're going to talk about insanity, uh, the insanity defense, uh, different uh, methods to measure or assess insanity. Uh, and But first we're going to start by looking at individuals. And I've chosen these individuals specifically uh, because some mounted insanity defenses, some didn't and should have, some uh, attempted but weren't allowed to. Uh, a, a wider range of cases, and I want to give you one caveat right off the bat. I chose extreme examples to show flaws in the system. This is not the way most cases go down. So uh, I chose examples because they're representative of big holes in the system and also because, because they're interesting. So let's take a look at what's going to go on here. Uh, what we can look at right off the bat then is forensic assessment and what do we know? It's basically just the idea that psychologists evaluate the mental status of defendants and there's two basic questions that really need to be answered. The first, and, and we'll make this separation throughout the lecture, is competency. Is a competency assessment, that is, is the person competent to stand trial or is there something that interferes with their abilities to do so? Question one, and if they are competent to stand trial, then uh, is the defendant in some way not responsible for their acts and, and that would uh, constitute an insanity defense. So, so we're going to move through these ideas uh, pretty much the whole time. Now it leads to a, uh, this important distinction then that competency is the defendant you know, able to stand trial and, and competency requires us assessing the mental state of the defendant at this moment in time right, during the competency test. Whereas insanity becomes more problematic because it refers to their mental state at the time of the crime. Uh, so it's weird because it's retrospective. We have to go back. If the trial is two years past the, the time the crime occurred, then we're discussing uh, a person's mental state two years prior. And that becomes complicated and that, that's where we run into some problems. And if we determine that in fact they were suffering a mental disorder at the time, there was something that interfered with their ability, uh, their abilities uh, to operate within society, and we'll get to the specific criteria as we move through the lecture, should they ultimately be held responsible for their actions? So that's, that's kind of where it's at. Now, what we have then is a fun little quiz here. So what you might want to do is get yourself a piece of paper and uh, number it from like 1 to 13, uh, going down the left column. And then going across, there's a couple questions. Can you identify the person, first of all? So what's their name? That should, that should be your first column, right, other than the number column. Uh, then the second slash third column should be, were they competent to stand trial, yes or no? And then finally, the last column was, uh, did they mount a successful insanity defense? So that's basically what we're going to do. Let's go ahead and look at our characters here. So do your best. A lot of these you might not know. And if you know all of them, then uh, maybe we should worry a little bit about you. <laughs> not really. So name who it is. Then uh, decide. Uh, whether they're insane at the time of the crime, and finally then, uh, whether they're competent to stand trial. So who am I? Number one. Here we go. So at this point, you write down, oh, this is so-and-so, and, -so, and uh, yeah, they were competent to stand trial, and uh, yes or no, they mounted an insanity defense. So that's kind of, so there's number one, and uh, let's try him, okay. Let's go to number two, uh, and... Uh, this is an interesting one. We might even go go bucks on this one. That's a big hint there, if you, if you so uh, like it. Okay. And then uh, let's try something else here. And number three. Who am I? No clowning around on this one. Bad jokes. That's number three. Okay. Next up. 
Who am I? And this is probably maybe the most famous of the whole bunch, so yeah, you might be pretty good at getting this one. Uh, now, this, the second two questions, though, they're getting the name is one thing. Uh, were they competent to stand trial, and uh, did they attempt to amount an insanity defense? Let's go to our next one, number five. Who am I? He's arguably the smartest of the bunch. Maybe uh, people estimate maybe an IQ of 180 on this guy. And I mean, that's getting way up there. This is a very intelligent person. Uh, next up, who am I? Number six, kind of a nice looking young man. Uh, what do we got to say about him? What did he do? Who is he? Uh, competent to stand trial? Found to be not guilty by reason of insanity, no insanity defense, you know the story by now. Number seven, this is a local boy in the news, maybe one of the less well known. Uh, in fact, these crimes occurred maybe just a couple years after I got to Ohio State and was in graduate school. So it goes back a little ways, but uh, if your parents are watching, maybe they can help you out too. All right, next up, who am I? So again, you're trying to try and figure out who this is. You might imagine a name on this one, uh, uh, another hint. All right, so that's number what, eight? Okay, let's, let's go on up to number nine. Right. And there you go. Who am I? Wait, 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 that's a, that, uh, that's a feeble attempt at humor. Uh, that is Saddam Hussein. He's not on the list, so never mind. Okay, uh, this is probably as well known as the other one I was saying was well known. So this, this guy is extremely well known and uh, many of you watched a TV show recently, uh, a multi-part TV show uh, that discussed this guy. So the question is, uh, and we have to learn about his case, which is something we'll talk. Okay, not many African Americans represented in here, and that, that's probably a good thing, but this is one that I think is, is an agile, absolute tragic story, and, and we'll talk about him uh, further down in the lecture. Okay. So that's number 11. We've got two more to go. Who am I? Number 12. Okay, you've got to go on the Wayback Machine here. Uh, if you get this one, you're really on a roll. This, this is a toughie, but, but important to us. And then uh, number 13, here we go. Uh, and, and of course, he was portrayed in a movie, oh, probably 15 years ago. Uh, so let's talk about him. Uh, please make your, make your guesses, or if you know, write them on down. And then uh, we're going to stay tuned for the answers on this. Okay. So let us begin. You got your uh, notes all ready to go? Let's take a look. We're going to, first of all, say, who am I? Number four. Okay, who is he? Uh, and, of course, if we were in the classroom, uh, some people would be raising their hands or shouting out the answer. Uh, you can do that at home. That, that's fine, or wherever you happen to be. Uh, like I said, probably the most well-known. Who, who is this? This is, this is Charles Manson. And uh, here's Charles Manson's family members. Uh, he was the leader of the family. And... Charles Manson, uh, an amazing case. Charles Manson spent most of his, uh, at least half of his lifetime in juvenile detention and or in jail. Uh, he had a horrible childhood. Uh, there's a, a story at one point that Charlie's uncle came to, to look for Charlie one day to come and see him and found Charlie's mom and said, hey, where the heck is Charlie? And uh, Charlie's mom didn't want to fess up and then finally she admitted she had traded him to a bartender in lieu of her bar tab. Uh, the uncle then went to retrieve Charlie. This is not someone who had a, a good life, let's put it that way. And that's not to excuse it, it's just interesting to understand where people came from and how maybe they got to where they got. Uh, in the 1960s, 1970s, the world was kind of up in, in upheaval. A lot of people were uh, members of the counterculture, so to speak, and there was a lot of uncertainty and a lot of people responded to that by looking for kind of strong authoritarian leaders and yes Manson is an authoritarian his authority over his followers his family was absolute uh, he, he gave them drugs he, he demanded sex from them uh, they committed petty crimes on behalf of the family 
they lived out in the hills, uh, Santa Susana Pass in Southern California. That's actually only about 10, 15 miles from where I lived. And uh, then they moved out to the Barker Ranch out towards Death Valley a little after that. Scary guy, uh, random murders, right? Absolutely random. So here's Charles Manson. Uh, there's his family, and you can see the ever-present Manson looking over his family. Uh, Sharon Tate, Rowan Polanski's wife at the time, was pregnant, living up on Cielo Drive, and uh, this is the thing. Charles Manson directed his family members to, in fact, go up to Sharon Tate's house. They wanted a high-profile victim. There was five people there, and the Manson family members went in and shot and stabbed uh, all, all the people there, uh, in fact, killing uh, Sharon Tate's unborn uh, fetus at, at the time as well. This is a heinous crime. They wrote uh, slogans like pigs, uh, etc., on, on, on the wall in, in the victim's blood. Now, why would someone do that? Well, Manson was convinced at this point that he was essentially the second coming of Christ uh, or, or some such kind of uh, position that he saw for himself. What he really needed to gain power, he believed, was to start a race war between the African Americans and the white people. So these were staged to look potentially like they might have been African American crimes committed against white people, at which point this would foment a race war and Charlie's twisted thinking was that once the race war was completed, the African Americans would win, but then they would be unable to govern themselves. So they would look for someone to lead them, and Charles Manson would arise at that time and, uh, in fact, go ahead and take, uh, take over the world, essentially, or at least take over the country. This period of time was called Helter Skelter. Charles Manson believed that the Beatles were writing lyrics directly to him. He was a big Beatles aficionado. He tried to launch his own musical career unsuccessfully. So what do we know? Well, the LaBiancas were killed not too much longer, uh, just a couple days after this, and the LaBiancas were uh, famous grocers, wealthy people who lived in Glendale, California. Again, the method of operation was the same, go into their house in the middle of the night and uh, stab them and write slogans on the walls. Crazy thing is, and, and this is a testament to Manson's influence, is these folks that did these crimes on Manson's request did so while Manson remained at home. So he didn't even have to go to force people to do this. His, his control over people was so complete that, in fact, he could get people to hop in a van and go do the deed and then come on back uh, to, to the spawn ranch. So, what do we know? Well, uh, here's another picture you can see uh, above Sharon Tate there. Then these are Manson family members after Manson was arrested for the crimes. Uh, family members who were not implicated in the crimes then uh, would come to the trial in, in Los Angeles every day. And, and they would literally crawl on hands and knees from where they were standing to the courthouse. Uh, Manson's influence was so profound one day during the trial, uh, while he was in his jail cell, he had found something sharp and he carved a swastika into his forehead. Uh, upon seeing him that day, the family members the next day when they arrived at the, uh, at the trial had swastikas carved into their foreheads as well. Uh, a man of tremendous power and influence. Manson, well, okay, so he was competent. He was found competent to stand trial. He stood trial uh, and Vincent Bugliosi was the prosecutor. The book Helter Skelter named for the Beatles song, which Manson said would be the overturning of the world, so to speak, uh, was the title of Bugliosi's book. Uh, Bugliosi is a hard-nosed Italian-American prosecutor, uh, no-nonsense kind of guy. Uh, the, the book is a fascinating read. So bottom line, what do we have? Manson was competent to stand trial, so we can put that in the first column. Was he competent or not? Yes. He attempted to represent himself. Now, he wasn't qualified to do this, and this is something we're going to be talking about throughout the course. Uh, there's that old saying, that, and, and there's a couple different ways to put it, but a, a person who chooses to represent themselves as a fool for an attorney. Some people say a person who chooses to represent themselves as a fool for a, a client. Uh, basically, the meaning is the same in either case. Not the best option. Uh, he was unsuccessful in his ability to defend himself. Uh, it's questionable whether he should be allowed to attempt it in, in the first place. 
and of course uh, he was found guilty and sentenced to death uh, at, at San Quentin in California. When the death penalty was overturned, all uh, death penalties were then commuted to life without possibility of parole, and that was Manson's eventual outcome. There we go, Charles Manson. So let's talk about competency as we bring this up then. What is competency? Let's get an honest to God definition. Capacity to function meaningfully and knowingly in the legal system. Right? And what does that include? What does that mean? Well, it means understanding the legal system as part of the deal. Right? Uh, assisting in one's own defense. Making legally relevant decisions. Can be raised at any time, but usually this is brought pre-trial, and we've talked about this in the past, uh, as, uh, getting to be a long time ago. But remember those pre-trial motions: Do you have an attorney, etc.? Do we want to suppress any evidence? This is often pre-trial. There's a question as to the defendant's competency to make decisions or to somehow participate meaningfully in the trial. Why is this important? Well. Because we like to think that our justice system is relatively fair uh, and, and unbiased. So the idea is the trial can only really be determined to be fair if the person can assist in their own defense. It would not be much fun to watch a boxing match where one of the participants in the match had their hands tied behind their back and the other fighter just pummeled them. We would not, as competitive as, as we are in this country, we, we would not think that that was a fair competition. Uh, it's not fighting the good fight. So competency is important to us because we want to make sure that people fight the good fight. Now, punishment is only morally defensible if the target knows what's happening. So the idea here is straightforward that, that if someone's going to be punished, they need to know what they're being punished for. Right? And, and to do otherwise, then, we might deem as unfair. The perceived fairness, and this gets back to my original point, the perceived fairness in our adversarial system is that the defendant is able to fight back, right? So and that's what we like. Now, how is this assessed, right? Because we have to operationalize this. It's one thing, but that, that we have to put some boundaries or some definitions around the term. So the Dusky Standard was employed originally, and it's a rational and factual understanding of the proceedings, right? So. Questions that, that surround or questions that need to be answered by various competency assessment instruments we'll look at later. Am I aware of the nature of the proceedings? Do I understand I'm in a courtroom? Do I understand what's being done in this courtroom? Okay. Can I cooperate with the counsel in preparing my own defense? The Edwards Standard in Indiana versus Edwards 2008, and notice that the bar continues to become raised as we gain experience with the system, Right to serve as one's own counsel sets a higher level of competence than just participating in one's trial. So to be a participant and, and help your attorneys is, is kind of a lower bar than actually stepping forward as Manson wants to do and essentially mastermind his own defense. So a higher standard. Now, other aspects of competency, like competency to plead guilty, that is and we've talked about plea bargaining previously. The idea is if I engage in a plea bargaining, do I, am I competent to understand what that means? Do I understand what my alternatives are to the plea bargain? Do I understand what the potential consequences are? Am I able to do at least some rudimentary statistical uh, assessment uh, of probabilities? Uh, should I do this or should I not? Okay. So what's the consequences of pleading guilty? Am I able to make a rational choice by weighing the consequences, the possible decisions? And uh, let's go then to, who am I, number seven. Tough one. Local boy, right? Ohio, born and bred. What do we know? Who are we? Well, we're Charles McCoy, Jr. And what do we know about Charles McCoy, Jr.? I'm, I'm going to read this here. So defense attorney Mark Collins said, Dr. Mills at Columbia University is evaluating Charles McCoy Jr. to determine if he's competent to stand trial. That means that the 28-year-old understands the charges against him and can help with his defense. Mills is also gathering information to determine if McCoy should plead innocent by reason of insanity. One of the important aspects of having uh, an attorney is negotiating these difficult decisions. So what do we know? What happened? Well, Charles McCoy, this is his appearance in court in May after jurors could not agree whether he was mentally ill. Okay, so we jumped ahead. He was competent to stand trial, and he offered a plea of not guilty by reason of insanity. 
Charles McCoy had admitted firing the shots for over five months in 2003 and 2004, but pleaded innocent by reason of insanity to murder in 23 other counts. His death penalty trial ended in a mistrial. What did he do? Is probably the big question right now. Well, he was known as the 270 shooter or the Beltway shooter. And what he did was position himself by the south part of I-270 here in Columbus, Ohio. And initially he was throwing things at cars off of overpasses, etc. But eventually he escalated to the point where he got a rifle and he was shooting people. Uh, so he did some damage to cars, but eventually he, uh, he actually shot a woman and, and killed her as she was driving on the 270. Right. So. Mentally ill man pleaded guilty to involuntary manslaughter and 10 other charges Tuesday in a series of Ohio shootings and was sentenced to 27 years in prison. So let's lay this out. He pleads not guilty by reason of insanity as a trial. The jury can't agree. They can't come to a uni uh, unanimous decision on his insanity. So in fact, the judge declares a mistrial. The prosecutor comes back and wants to retry the case. So the case is retried, which is allowable in terms of a mistrial, but the case doesn't ever really become retried the second time. What does McCoy do? He consults with, his, uh, with, uh, with the judge especially and copped a plea. So he, he made a plea bargain and that was to be 27 years in prison. Okay, what do we know? Well, McCoy, Columbus told psychologists he threw wood and bags of concrete mix off the overpass and shot at cars to quiet voices in his head that called him a wimp. I understand nobody likes being called a wimp. Psychiatrists both sides agreed that McCoy had severe delusions and that television programs, commercials were speaking directly to him and mocking him. And we know we don't like to be mocked, so that, that's, a, that's another issue as well. Oh boy. Let's think about this for a minute. Now, he seems that everyone's admitting he's delusional, but now the question is, how delusional? And is that delusional state enough to release him from responsibility? Okay. So, what do we know? Why is he doing this? Toward the end of the shootings, he believed firing from overpasses would make the news coverage of Michael Jackson stop. And this is when Michael Jackson was big time in the news with potential molestation accusations coming out, out of Neverland. Yes, it was on the news quite a bit, and I guess McCoy didn't take well to it, so he was going to effectively counter this problem. The first trial then, which ended up in, in, in May with the jury unable to decide whether he was insane, centered on whether McCoy's delusions kept him from understanding that the shootings were wrong, and we'll look at the insanity components here in a minute. Prosecutors then decided not to pursue the death sentence, so juries, you know, might operate a little differently. The prosecution's psychiatrist said that uh, McCoy still showed he knew the actions were wrong and, and the steps he took to avoid capture, such as moving the shootings as, as the police were getting closer, uh, was a demonstration that he was a 